think it's time that we all reject the idea of necessary evils. Now, many of you have probably heard the term necessary evil or its foul cousin, the lesser of two evils, invoked to justify things that don't seem ideal, but just seem to be the way the world works or the world has to work in order for things to continue to go not good, but continue to go decent. We will oftentimes hear that in the American political context, that voting for Republican or Democrat is not a matter of weighing their positions and considering the merits thereof, but rather it is a matter of voting for the lesser of two evils. And you have also heard, I've also heard this term necessary evil invoked to justify many things that, that to me don't seem very necessary. They just seem plain evil. The reason we ought to reject the normalization of evil in our political discourse is not simply because evil is evil and evil should be rejected, although that is self-evident and that should be something that we shouldn't even have to discuss. Evil is evil and evil should be rejected. But there's a deeper point to make that may appeal to minds who's, who, who are saddled with these concepts and who have come to accept them as a necessary part of our political discourse. The reason we ought to reject the term necessary evil and all necessary evils is because necessary evils muddle our ability to see things in society and the world and in politics clearly and to see them for their own merits and to see them, most importantly, in light of first principles. If you cannot reason in light of first principles, you cannot reason coherently. Every line of thought begins with a premise. The laws of logic are actually rather clear on this. The premise begins the argument, and the premise should ultimately follow to the conclusion. Trying to reason without first principles is like trying to reason without first stating a premise and simply jumping towards a conclusion. It is incoherent, it is an assertion, and it gets you, nor your interlocutor, nor your society, nor your government, absolutely anywhere. But before I delve into that, we should also understand something about how these terms are used, as I mentioned, to normalize things that in all reality should not be normalized and should not be justified. For example, the COVID lockdowns, this is a story reported by the Daily Mail, the COVID lockdowns in the United Kingdom were actually called a necessary evil. And this same kind of rhetoric was used across the West by the so-called experts saying that if we didn't lock down the society, all kind of bad things would happen. They used a what we call a utilitarian calculus to make decisions about the lives and most importantly, the rights of people in the West. And in doing so, they actually missed the totality of the situation and they ended up causing more harm than good, such as the fact that a lot of people in New York City, as we understand, died in nursing homes because the governor decided in the name of, of, of consequences to move sick people into nursing homes. We, we also understand that school children in America especially are stunted in the development due to the fact that they were forced to do remote distance learning for years during the pandemic. But all of this is, is excused and justified by saying it was a necessary evil. Uh, there has been also people saying that AI is a necessary evil, particularly generative AI, which has the ability not only to displace human jobs, that's just one thing that, by the way, it's kind of normal in the history of economics, but more insidiously, it has the ability to twist and skew our perception of what is real and what is not. And secondarily, it has the ability to twist and skew our connection with our own human nature because the more man becomes merged with machine, the less man he becomes. And the less man he becomes, the less reference point does he have to point back to his humanity by way of measuring the world, by way of measuring morality. We get our morality by understanding how human beings work on a social level. AI threatens all of that but yet it's called a necessary evil. Kamala Harris, well, not Kamala Harris, but Kamala Harris suggested she move the goalpost away from the traditional leftist view of abortion. Abortion back in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, it was considered to be a, a, a it was considered to be permissible under the standard of being, uh, of being safe, legal, and rare. That was the standard. Now, while I have, I have obviously, I reject that standard because I think that abortion itself is immoral. It is wrong, and no, and no, no single standard beyond the moral standard would be able to justify such an action. But still, that was the general prevailing orthodoxy: safe, legal, and rare. This was invoked by many people. Well, now 
that language of abortion being a necessary evil has actually gravitated to it being a fundamental result of reproductive functions. It was treated as a necessary evil, and it just became normalized after a while. I can keep going on and on and on. A fact that is oftentimes ignored by many folks on the left, especially Chank Uger and his entire group, his entire crew, about the Armenian genocide. If we look at the language of how people have historically justified genocide, they have done so by using the language, the rhetoric, of necessity. For example, the Armenian Genocide particularly, there were officials in the Ottoman Empire when this happened back in 1915 who were a part of the Young Turks and their party, the, com the Committee of Union and Progress, and one official, Nezem Bey, delivered a speech at the Party of Community, uh, com Committee of Union and Progress, and he said, and I quote, it is absolutely necessary to eliminate the Armenian people in its entirety. He then said again, it is necessary that not even a single Armenian survive this annihilation. The best way to get someone to accept an argument is to not justify the argument on its own merits, but instead to justify it in light of some grand event, some grand catastrophe, or some grand goal that you wish to achieve as a politician or as a social activist. This is precisely what the philosopher Hannah Arendt points out that Hitler did when he was creating the Third Reich. Hitler applied this simplified view of the world to Germans. He used the idea of the Volk, this sort of German spiritual unity that all German people have by virtue of them existing, used the idea of the Aryan race, and cast the entire world in those two ideas, and then used that to drive home so many atrocities because he could not justify the atrocities by reason or by intellect. I mean, Hitler killed the intellectuals. He killed a lot of people that were fighting against him verbally. He could only justify it by appealing to the emotional sense of people who have an understanding or a crude understanding of broad, tribalistic, factionalistic concepts. And so necessity goes from being a rational invocation to being merely a emotional uh, word that triggers something in the hearts and minds of men. But this, net, this language of necessity does something else that I think is quite insidious and needs to be called out. It tries to infuse pragmatism into politics to the extent that politics is no longer about what should be. It's solely about what is. And what is is what we should look at, not what should be. This is how people maintain the status quo. This is how people justify mediocrity. This is how people make all kinds of excuses for inferior things by not wanting to actually interact with why those things are inferior or bad, but instead wanting to solely say, this is what is realistic. But the problem is, realism, especially what is considered to be realistic by a particular society, is dictated almost entirely by the understanding of the political and social conditions of that society by people within them. If the colonialist in pre-colonial America thought that it was more realistic, which probably was, to be a serf to King George, they would have never, ever thrown the tea over at the Harvard, they would have never ever written pamphlets invoking natural rights, invoking moral universalism to beat back the monarchical patriarchism of the king. They would have never done any of that. They would have simply sat down there and they would have continued to labor under slavery. But there comes a time in every man's moral education where he realizes the discordant nature of society versus the, the versus of what should what it should be according to morality and he is compelled to act in a manner that requires changing the status quo that requires blowing up the Overton window and that also requires bringing other people into that vision with you and that's what our founders did America is a product of that moral realization but this talk of necessary evils stunts that ability in the minds of men and puts him in the throes of the status quo and causes him, or at least encourages him, not to question why we are normalizing evil, but to instead accept it. I'm going to give you a radical notion before I close. There is no such thing as necessary evils. There are only habituated evils.
The only reason we would say that we should pick the lesser of two evils in terms of the two parties is because we have for a very long time refused to accept the possibility and refused to let in the possibility that there should be more than two parties, that the partisanship in our country is tearing us apart, and that we should be bound to simply two choices. That evil has been habituated. What does habituation mean? It means that you do something for so long that it becomes so normal that to live without it seems almost impossible because it has defined your entire life. This is how bad habits happen. You smoke a little bit. You smoke twice. You smoke, and then, then your entire life, for 30 years, you're smoking, smoking, smoking. And when you try to get rid of it, you can't. You have all kind of antsy feelings because you're tied to that thing. Well, in the similar way, a lot of people in society are tied to the two-party system simply because they have not thought to conceptualize a society, a politics that is independent of the two-party system. And so they leave themselves to be susceptible to evil by accepting it without question. Habituated evil is what we are dealing with in society, not necessary evil. Evil is not necessary, it is aberrant, it is deviant, and it must be fought with as much moral fortitude as we as Americans can afford to muster up against it. Period. If you wish to actually proceed forth righteously and correctly in the due course of social relationships and politics, if you understand the importance of having a rational ability to assess first principles and then apply them to political matters, if you understand the importance of striving towards what is right, not towards what is bad for the sake of being complacent and the sake of efficiency, then you should reject necessary evils. Because there will come a time where those necessary evils, which are really the habituated evils, are no longer necessary. They are more so imposed normalized and dominant. And when that happens, you better hope and pray. You have enough people around you that are willing to reject the dominant evils of the day. Because if history tells us anything, most people in societies, when evil arises, they're complacent, they're ballasts, they will sit there, accept it, and go along with it. And only a small minority of people, if ever, will speak out against it. That has been the history of human revolutions for a very long time. And that will continue to be the history of how our societies progress if we don't get a hold over our moral education. We must get a hold over our moral sensibilities. Reject natural, uh, reject net necessary evils. Embrace natural law. Embrace natural rights. Embrace first principles. Embrace reason. And embrace love of humanity. That is how we win. That is how we get better politics. That is how we get a better society, and that is how we have more clarity about the world and our place in it as Americans and fundamentally as human beings. My friends, like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let us make this channel successful. Let us get a revolution of the mind. Let us do it. We're going to do it. I know we will. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm confident. And I think that when more people hear this message, they will be blessed by it, and they will be enriched by it in their soul and in their mind. My friends, study history. Study philosophy. Remain morally convicted and please, please, stay pensive. Bye, guys.